from McKinnon Park in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So I like talking about chapter four on terror and chapter six on embarrassment back to back as they have a lot of similarities as to why they are important things for us to embrace in order to create and or explore art. So first, we need to define the difference between embarrassment and another word that many times I hear people use as a synonym, which is shame. So one of my favorite authors and writers is a woman named Brene Brown. In fact, I love her so much that I've gotten certified in her theory of daring to lead, uh, which is based in her research on vulnerability and shame. So daring to lead is about finding courage in one's vulnerability. So we spend a lot of time in the, my classes that I do on that, um, establishing the differences between embarrassment and shame. So I wanna look at that a little bit tonight. I'm going to make it really simple by citing both Anne Bogart and Brene Brown. Brown defines shame as the intensely painful feeling or experience of belief that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. That something that we've experienced or done or failed to do makes us unworthy of connection. Shame is not helpful nor productive. In fact, shame is much more likely to be the source of destruction, hurtful behaviors than the solution or the cure. Shame is used many times also as a weapon um, in order to maybe gain power. To be clear, I don't know if I made this clear, shame should never be used, especially not to motivate and manage, although we see it all the time in films. Shame is also not guilt. Guilt is something that you put on yourself, but shame, shame is placed on you. Okay, for example, I can feel guilty that I didn't spend as much time with my children, right, when they were younger. So I was trying to establish my career. And this may be, uh, result in me being what, a better mother to them today or more of a more attentive grandmother knowing now what I didn't seem to get back then, all right? that can be guilt. Shame is heavier, it's uglier, and it's tougher to navigate. So say, for example, you did something maybe illegal. Let's say uh, you got picked up for a DUI. So you have to tell your employer because you're going to need some time off for court. Now, in addition to making amends to your community through what, court fees and time, you need to make amends to your family, right? By apologizing, by sobering up, by being just better. Maybe you are gonna become a mentor that find others uh, making the same bad choices. But your boss, maybe seven years later, says something to you like, well, you know, we kept you despite your drinking problem, so you are naturally going to have to continue to work what, longer and harder than Mary over here who has never been picked up for anything illegal or anything that they know about. See, that, that's shame. So think about this in your own relationships. Are there people in your life that tell you that you are what, not smart enough, you're not pretty enough, you're not good enough, you're not educated enough, and as human beings, we are broken, but we cannot be defined by our worst moment. We find films are all made of, a lot of films are made of that particular thought. If someone in your life is doing that to you though, or you are doing it to someone else, you better make it stop because it is shame and it is damaging. All right, embarrassment, this chapter, whole different ball game. Bogart addresses it in the beginning on the bottom of page 115. Usually we think of embarrassment at worst shame and at least self-consciousness or awkwardness. However, the etymology of the word means to be an obstruction. So it's uh, something that gets in our way. Embarrassment 
therefore means to hinder, to complicate, to impede. Can you tell I'm doing a lot of crossword puzzles while we're home? Anyway, Bogart writes, I like to think of embarrassment as an obstruction we encounter that helps us clarify our mission. See, this is where I think terror and embarrassment are a lot alike, as they're both good teachers. Bogart even says that in her book, they're good teachers. That is, you risk learning nothing if you always avoid anything where there is embarrassment as a possibility. Specifically, Bogart says, if you try to avoid being embarrassed by what you do, nothing will happen because the territory remains safe and unexposed. To, avo to avoid embarrassment is a natural human tendency. And feeling truly exposed to others is rarely a comforting sensation. But if what you do or make does not embarrass you sufficiently, then it's probably not personal or intimate enough. I think that is so, so, so true. I mean, I am a theater professor. I have a BA in English. The song from Avenue Q, by the way. I have an MA in theater and I have a terminal degree in so specifically theatrical direction. Okay. I have directed over 120 shows, New York to Idaho. I have been taught or mentored by some of the most amazing academics and theorists and directors in the world. Me. Me. A girl who just grew up on a farm outside of Garrett's in South Dakota. I mean, how does that even happen? Who told me? So who graduated with 31 people, that I could travel the world, that I could learn for the rest of my life. I've really thought about this. And I, I think it's because I was raised by blue collar parents who always said something like, well, what's the worst thing can happen to you? I won't kill you. Give it a try. I'm sure you guys kind of were raised by the same people. My dad was even more direct. He said, toots, I swear my dad did not know my real name. He never used it. He'd say, Toots, I hate to break it to you, but you're not that important. No one is paying any attention to you. I mean, it sounded harsh, but he was absolutely right. What I thought would be failure typically was just maybe a bout of a possibility of embarrassment. So I got over it real quick. Also, here's a little unknown fact about me. I am a crippled introvert. It's a true story. I make my living in drama, but I like to stay home. Most days I'm, like I said, living in, in some type of communication, but there are days for me that I find so overwhelming. It's tough to leave the house, but I love directing and I love directing even huge, large casts of 70. And I can find intimacy, intimacy and, and purpose when I'm in rehearsal, even with a large cast. But once a show opens, I am a social mess. People will rarely see me before or after a show, but I'm there. I hide in the corners or up in the balcony. Ask anyone who's ever been directed by me. I have little desire to mingle and talk about the show. So as I've been musing about this chapter this week and creating this video, it finally occurred to me that maybe why being in the public when my art is being observed is because I feel a level of embarrassment. Do I want the community, which includes my family and friends, to be entertained or moved by production? Absolutely. But do I want to make small talk to have to explain it? No. No, I don't. I, I can't explain the depth of work that is typically on that stage, the analysis, the relationships, the choices, the entire six to eight week process in some quick two minute passing without risking coming off as sounding simple or trite or maybe even the opposite, maybe pretentious, which would be worse. And I think that that small talk maybe kind of embarrasses me. I must do it as I have to lean into that risk that I may have to point them to something deeper, um, which maybe is embarrassing for them if I point it out. 
I, I don't know if this makes any sense. Um, I'm just kind of throwing it out there and I'm going to continue to chew on this. It's been a real kind of revelation for me this week. And here's a moment that I maybe would love, love, love to have you respond to this for me. I mean, challenge me to look at this differently and do not, do not be embarrassed to offer your opinion. To be honest, that's kind of how I came to this class. I was a, I was really a bit embarrassed walking into it for the first time. I've had those moments of, oh my gosh, I'm a fraud. My students know I'm a fraud, which made me look long and hard at who I was in the classroom, be honest with who I am as a teacher of arts, what I can offer, and what could elevate all of our thought processes and experiences when it comes to watching art, or specifically in this case, movies and film. Because I risk embarrassment, I continue to evolve, and I hope so does this class. I mean, think about it. Even in the email that I sent a couple days ago, I asked you to be kind as I learned how to navigate new technology, and I used my age as an excuse. That was me being a bit embarrassed that my videos will become off less than what cool or professional because of some type of ageist stereotype. But I did it. I'm, I'm doing it. Bogart includes a lot of stories about small-minded actors responding to roles as if they already have that character all figured out. I'm telling you, there is nothing worse for a director, film stage, than that. I mean, I, at least I feel that way. I mean, can you imagine if all the amazing actors that you watched thus far entered the studio ready to film, but then says to the director, uh, yeah, no need to offer ideas. Uh, thanks anyway, Spielberg. I, I totally understand this character and um, I'm ready to shoot. I mean, we certainly would not be able to experience some of the raw performances that we've seen so far. I mean, for example, Gabby Sibide and Monique and Precious. I mean, those are raw. Those were happening in the moments and those were directed and people finding themselves. And Timothy Hutton and Mary Tyler Moore, Davis, uh, uh, Donald Sutherland and Ordinary People. Or maybe Liam Nielsen, Ray Fiennes and Ben Kingsley and Schindler's List. I mean, these were people that were vulnerable and risking some embarrassment. Man, these are, these are performances dripping in it and can only result if the actor is willing to open themselves up to moments of unknown through the process. Okay, the beginning of page 118, Bogart outlines 10 things to consider as we, actor or teacher or police officer, a nurse, computer tech, I don't know, insert your occupation, as we welcome and work through tough moments of embarrassment. Okay, I'm not going to list those 10 things as you're all reading them. Um, but they're all really pretty great nuggets of advice. I'm going to point out a few pages and sound bites that resonate with me. Um, and then I'll be posting some extra stories to add some flavor. The paragraph that begins with, a director cannot hide from an audience because intentions are always visible, palpable. I think it's really par a paragraph that's rich with truths. Again, I think audience, I hate cool words, but audience could be substituted with classroom, boardroom, I mean, whatever room of which you are trying to show your own mastery, right? I mean, right now it might be your living room as most of us are working remotely um, or homeschooling. Bogart continues and says, an, audience's an audience senses your attitude towards them. They smell your fright or condescension, uh, right? Talking down to them. They know instinctively that you want only to impress or conquer. They set, sense your engagement or your lack of it. Again, this is her telling us that great moments, like, like you've talked about those conversations that you've cherished, those projects that surpassed your expectation um, and art, that lives eternal. I mean, real art that lives eternal can only happen when contact is real and worthy and that embarrassment was risked. 
then she really, really kind of lets us have it. She says that in order to grow as a human being, and certainly as an artist or a patron of the arts, which hopefully you will all be, you must be um, ready to live in the following, right? Know these things. Number one, it matters how you treat people. Number two, it matters how you take responsibility in a crisis. Three, it matters as to what you value for your politics matter. Five, what you read, and I and here I would insert what you watch from TV to news to films matters. Number six, how you speak and which words you choose matter. I say this over and over, rhetoric matters. Five, you can't hide. I'm gonna post a story about my friend Jack who's really a great artist. He's a true Renaissance man. And how these things mentioned above have and are affecting his current quality of life. So I'll post that, I'll label it simply Jack. How's that for originality? And Jack has chosen to approach, approach embarrassment in a way that's negatively affecting his life. Also, I wanna point out that this book that you have, your textbook was published about 20 years ago. I mean, how amazing to contemplate these things that she just, I just went through these one, you know, how do you treat people? Um, how are, are you um, responsible in a crisis? What do you value? What are your politics? And are you brave enough um, to hang on to what you believe to be true within your politics or your ethics? This one right now, as you did, was a different four, four years ago or six months ago or yesterday. I, mean, I struggle with that a lot. And I've made a promise in the last, especially where we're at now, recently, um, for me, that I, I watch as much time watching Fox as I do watch CNN every day. I mean, whether it's 10 minutes or an hour, I'm really working to meld my questions and my values as things are evolving politically in my life and, and the world with a civil mind, mindness, mindness. That's helpful. What you put inside your brain via media or literature or the arts is important. Are you being compassionate with your words? Are you clear and direct when necessary? I mean, I even say to be vague, actually Brene Brown says this, to be vague can be unkind. And are you engaging? Again, to be passive does not result in anything progressive from love to life to art to you name it. And for those of you that are left brainers in the world, okay, those that respond to science and math, and maybe this whole appreciation of, appreciation of art is new territory for you, Bogart reminds us that quantum physics suggests that nothing is at rest. Nothing stops, ever. So even in the act of choosing to observe something as it changes is in fact doing something. That's an active audience. But even then we arrive where something sufficiently embarrasses us can happen. Even when you're the audience. I'm gonna post a story about the first time that I had to identify the difference between shame and embarrassment in a situation. And then I had to decide whether to be an audience or to move into it um, with emotion. Um, I'll label it uh, the women's project. All right. Take a look at the bottom of page 127 and read that last paragraph, which continues on with some interesting ideas for the next couple pages. We talked about this um, in tear in that many times we are our own worst obstacles to getting exciting work done. Konstantin Stanislavski, the creator and director of the Moscow Art Theater at the turn of the century, we talked about him as in class when we were talking about acting, um, created ways for actors to do this. But they work, these, these ideas that he puts together with anyone who strives to have authentic conversations. To be believed as an actor, he, she, must be in the moment, actively listening, being, and they have to do it every single day as they perform the same play with the same words, with the same actor in the same space. So how is that different from the lives we live? 
we go to the same jobs with the same colleagues, we come home to the same house or apartment with the same family. We all seek things from one another, right? Stanislavski taught us method acting, which we spoke about again in class. He also created language like the magic if, which is very similar to goat that we covered in class when talking about what characters want, right? Goat, G, goal, who has what we want or need? What is it that we want at the end of the scene or the end of the conversation? Oh, obstacle or the other and understanding that relationship. T is for tactics, which is how we get what we want. And we know that a pull tactic is much more effective than a push. And of course, E on the goat is the expected outcome. Did it work? How did the conversation or the scene end? Did you reach your goal or not? My favorite sentence on page 130 is habit is an artist's opponent. Is that resonating with any of you? <laughs> I mean, you've heard it's difficult to teach an old dog a new trick, right? I would argue that the dog can learn the trick, but it may mean that the dog and those dealing with the dog will have feelings that are uncomfortable, unbalanced, and may contain a certain level of terror or embarrassment. It won't surprise you that I love, love, love the first paragraph on page 131. It begins, a director, I'd also insert maybe a teacher's job, is not to supply answers, but rather to provide interest. Yes. I hope with every cell of my being that you have at least found an interest in film and how to watch it differently thus far this semester. It's a simple equation that has interest that involve, revolves to curiosity and then the insecurity because all that means it's a new way of looking at something. And then once you tap into the insecurity, you develop questions, which means leaning into the risk of embarrassment that you don't know something that somebody else might. Right? Again, all of those words seem like negative, but they all can result in really great things. I mean, that's what you're paying for, to ask questions, to be challenged, to be ignited, to learn. I mean, it would totally suck paying for a class where you walk out not knowing any more about the subject or yourself than when you entered. I mean, at that point, you probably deserve a refund, except that then you have to ask yourself, what did I do actively to be vulnerable and curious and embarrassed, right? So Bogart sums up point six on this page by saying, in traveling onward, in pursuing an interest, we experience insecurity. Insecurity is not only okay, it is a necessity. It's a necessary ing ingredient. Her point seven uses embarrassment to one's own advantage and growth. She calls it, says, use accidents. I would like to add to this section, embrace those things that you thought maybe you wouldn't like, like I don't care, vegetables to a genre of film. I mean, your taste buds and your level of art sophistication evolves, you know. Um, I used to hate Brussels sprouts. They're now my favorite. Also, because you don't understand something doesn't make it less rich or right or valid. Just because, for example, um, your parents vote straight, straight Democrat or they vote straight Republican ticket doesn't mean you have to. Just because you didn't know anyone transgender growing up doesn't mean they're not there and they're less human. Just because uh, you didn't maybe grow up in a home where there was substance abuse or domestic abuse doesn't mean that you don't have a responsibility to be empathetic to those that did and are. And that's why films and art, for us films are so great because they invite us into worlds of which to explore our own mores and values and all sorts of humanity. And then, according to Aristotle, you are to use those moments of messiness and um, confusion at times and seek enlightenment. 
another story video um, that you can look for. I'm going to post it, uh, is about a long time minister from First Baptist Church here in Sioux Falls and how I had to ask him for permission and or support both when I went to direct a play called Boy Gets Girl by Rebecca Gilman at USF. Um, I don't know if you know this, but USF is under the auspices of the Baptist Church and to say it's a conservative place would be a little bit of an understatement. Uh, Boy um, Gets Girl includes some of the harshest language I've ever read in a play, let alone what have students stay on, say on stage. So check out that story that I'll post later as I ask an 85-year-old Baptist minister to say yes to numerous uses of the F word. Um, I'll call it F it, Roger. His name is Roger. Last couple of thoughts. I think the word to consider when you read point eight entitled Walk the Tightrope Between Control and Chaos is balance. Recognize when the unbalanced is so out of control that the potential of the moment may be lost. Like, are we focusing on the wrong thing? I see films do that all the time. On page 113, Bogart reminds us that at the same point, you need to stop studying and then just apply it. I'm an empirical learner, which means I work best when I'm doing something while studying, like working on that project. I encourage you to do the same as you read and learn about how to observe art. The last page on embarrassment gives you permission to narrow in when, need to, when you need to. Maybe instead of trying to come up with what Aristotle would say about the element of thought um, or an extended metaphor when watching one of these uh, extra credit films that you're watching, instead pick one and identify it's just that one character of what you can empathize and then find language for that. Or maybe download the soundtrack because it makes you happy. So I'll leave you with this. There is something endearing about those who can be vulnerable and embrace their embarrassment. To be able to laugh at yourself, it's attractive. Also, it reminds me of another saying that my mentor, Robert Cohen, writes in his book, Acting One. I have echoed this statement to every cast every night before the curtain goes up, and it is this. An audience will forgive anything but a lack of passion. I have a couple more short, short videos that I'm going to post. One I'm going to call Kim's Golden Rules, and the other one I'm just going to label Teaching Philosophy. I know you are all missing all my classroom stories, of course, and I don't want to deprive you of that when you are already suffering. Yes, this may be me trying to be funny, which is probably just embarrassing and which then I hope you find endearing. So now go watch some films. See you later. Carpe diem.